Um, so the second talk of uh, this session of QFT GRT um, is by by Sam Raskin. Um, this is a part part two of uh, 3D uh, mirror symmetry and geometric language. Take it away. Um, okay, so, um, so, uh, last time, uh, uh, we defined, um, sort of algebraic 3D, um, field theories. So these were sort of either nature one, two extended. So basically only defined on sort of one manifolds, which I think of as puncture disks. Uh, two manifolds, which I think of as proper algebraic curves, or maybe there's some ambient proper algebraic curve, not a big deal. And, uh, and only certain cobordisms are allowed for, uh, uh, I, I don't wish I could say for what reason. Um, it's just the way it goes. Um, and, uh, and so uh, uh, we also uh, sort of, we gave examples, um, uh, discussed uh, 3D n equals four theories, um, especially uh, sigma models um, into cotangent bundles, and uh, and uh, you know what I said was sort of uh, I'm going to call this for the moment like vanilla. Um, 3D mirror symmetry, um, which was the statement that if you took, um, so sigma models into T star Y, we called the theory T sub Y. Um, so, uh, so let me just sort of write this down a little more formally. So a pair of stacks X and X star is um, 3D mirror dual. Um, if uh, the theory for X um, is uh, equivalent to the theory for X dual, and then you apply this sort of what I called abstract mirror dual, this operation that just switches the A and B twists. And so uh, this is some kind of like uh, meta uh, conjecture in some sense. So when I say like, if they're isomorphic, I mean like if you expect them to be isomorphic, uh, let's just say, and also there's the issue that like an actual, the, the um, okay, maybe maybe people will, will be upset with me, but I would say that the 3D n equals four theory is a little fraught before you do these A and B twists. And what I'm writing here are supposed to be, so to say the analytic theories. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and the sort of like practical, you know, um, algebraic version, My cat is loud. Um, um, is that the A um, twist for this theory will be equivalent to the B twist um, for this theory and vice versa. Um, so part of the reason I, I want to formulate it in this way is that it should be sort of manifestly symmetric, although the actual consequences are asymmetric. It's funny. Business. Um, and yeah, and for me, it's sort of uh, mysterious because this thing is it's on unsteady footing and, and this thing is um, on quite steady footing. Um, and yeah, we talked a little bit about consequences for this. So we talked, so this implies equivalences of categories of line operators. So that means that. Um, on this side, D modules on the loop space of, of this X should be equivalent to coherent sheaves on the sort of um, like in a sense topological or Betty Durham, well, Durham maps from the puncture disk into this X star. Um, and, uh, and there are global consequences as well, I should say. So uh, global consequences, I mean, involving the proper algebraic curve. So um, this is gonna amount to some kind of equivalence of certain chiral homology. And if you believe that the line operator categories are equivalent, that sort of the 
chiral homology functors are going to be equivalent as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's the uh, brief summary of last time. Um, and um, today I want to um, add in uh, 4D and uh, groups G. <clears throat> so, um, uh, okay, so the first thing is that uh, uh, for me, a compact Lie group, I'm just going to speak, speak fluently between compact Lie groups and reductive groups. So if, uh, as a, if maybe you like UN, that's what I'm going to call GLN, like you should think of the corresponding complex Lie group. And uh, yeah. Um, and usually for me, G will just be the reductive group because things are algebraic and that's the convenient um, way to normalize things. Uh, okay, so kind of um, very briefly, a 4D, again, one, two extended um, quantum field theory, algebraic, um, is so to say the same um, as before, um, but, uh, but one categorical level higher. Um, so our smooth proper curve X um, is going to give rise to, so maybe I'll call this um, kind of bold T, to emphasize that it's four dimensions. Um, so before our 3D theory attached a, a vector space to, so to say, this two manifold. So now uh, we're going to take this, you know, again, quote unquote, two manifold and attach to it um, a DG category. Um, and Similarly, we're going to take these sort of one manifolds and attach to them um, uh, one manifolds, these punctured disks around points. This is going to be um, what I would call like a 2DG category. So something, uh, it's just basically a two category, but with lots of homotopy stuff around and some enrichment over whatever field that we're working over. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and sort of same. Um, kinds of cobord, same kinds of um, cobordisms are allowed. So it's again asymmetric, um, so on. And let me uh, just introduce like um, a little bit of of terminology um, at this moment, which is uh, very uh, standard terminology. So there's a notion of morphism between two theories. Um, so, like just some morphism is often called um, an interface, um, and uh, and an interface. Um, so there's a trivial two D theory, I should say. So this is going to attach to the curve, um, the category of vector spaces, and it will attach. Uh, to the punctured disk, the category of um, DG categories, the two category of DG categories. So kind of the stupidest things that, that you could do. Um, so there's a morphism from, so a morphism from the, well, an interface um, to the theory or from the theory to the trivial theory um, is a, uh, you know, this is a definition, is a boundary condition. Um, so in uh, uh, the physics setting, usually things are like, in a lot of places where this sort of terminology is used, a lot of things are topological. And so they're more symmetric than the situation I'm talking about here. Like the cobordisms I said are like asymmetric and so that applies in many different places. So, um, so you would usually picture an interface as something symmetric, whereas here it's, uh, it's uh, asymmetric. And let me say that sort of in 3D, it's sort of bad. 3D, like algebraic stuff, it's bad to um, think of interfaces um, as uh, symmetric. Um, but in 4D, it's sort of usually OK. 
So I'm going to just like there's a there's an experimental fact that like as you go up higher in your categorical complexity, certain things get sort of easier, like they become more dualizable, like thing like um, the category of vector of functions on a uh, affine variety is not at all dualizable. It's an infinite dimensional vector space, but uh, the category of quasi coherent sheaves on a variety is dualizable. Um, and uh, and so so things somehow that that rears its head here. So I, I'm just gonna be more sloppy in 4D sometimes than 3D about that stuff. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, Okay, so the sort of main uh, 4D theory of interest for us, well, let me, so first uh, the main 4D, so the main kind of, so the, the story now goes just like in 3D. So there should be some kind of analytic theory that we're gonna twist to get algebraic theories. And I wanna talk about the analytic theory as a little bit of a you know metaphor for my, my purposes. The so main 4D sort of, let me say analytic um, theory is um, 4D, N equals four, um, Yang Mills. Um, for G, and I'm gonna denote this um, by Yang Mills sub G. <clears throat> um, so uh, again, the N equals four, just like last time, it refers to the amount of supersymmetry that's, uh, that's around. And so I'm not gonna tell you what this theory is, but I will say it again has, um, has two twists and uh, um, yeah, actually, sorry. I wanna make, make one more uh, observation here, which is that um, I, I sort of wanna, wanna say this as, as a motivation before I go on to this, I just forgot before. So, um, so a sort of like boundary condition for the trivial 4D theory um, is going to be the same thing so um, as a 3D theory. Um, so I just sort of want to um, uh, want to briefly say why. So here, the trivial theory is attaching the category of vector spaces to like X and uh, and a morphism of like the category of vector spaces to itself, the way things are set up, it's automatically given by tensoring with some chain complex of vector spaces. And so that sort of morphism evaluated on X is it amounts to a vector space. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is encoding a sort of well-known phenomenon that a 3D theory is automatically at the boundary of some kind of trivial 4D theory. Uh, and so that's gonna be how the conversation today generalizes um, what happens before. So what we're going to do is say, um, it, sort of in a moment, there's going to be this Yang-Mills theory. And, uh, and in the case of the trivial group, this is going to be the trivial theory, the trivial 4D theory. And so a boundary condition for Yang-Mills in the case of the trivial group is a 3D theory. And a boundary condition for Yang-Mills more generally is going to be what we talk about today. <clears throat> um, so, uh, so this has... Uh, a and B twists. Um, in fact, it has more twists than this due to Kubuston and Witten, but let me just only talk about A and B right now. Um, that again, I call it Yang Mills G sub A and Yang Mills G sub B. Um, and let me just sort of explain what they do, uh, kind of what they are. So, um, so first, if I take this A twisted theory, and I evaluate this on the smooth proper curve X, I'm supposed to get some category. Um, and this is gonna be the category of D modules on the moduli stack of bundles for G. Um, and if I take this on the puncture disc, this is gonna be uh, the following uh, uh, category. So yeah, I mean, maybe I should write, um, all right, I'm not gonna be like super methodical about it. Um, so this is gonna be the following category. So I take, so here I sort of took maps from X into BG. That's a way of thinking about what bun G is. 
Um, it's the moduli stack of such maps. Now I'm going to do the same thing with the punctured disk, um, but into G instead of BG. Um, uh, maybe I could have said it better, but OK. So I'm going to take this algebraic loop space for G, take its category of D modules. Um, so this is monoidal under convolution. And I'm going to take module categories for it. Um, so, uh, so people who like very symmetric formulas like to write this uh, instead as sheaves of categories on the loop space of G Durham, um, where this was sort of um, like a, a categorical level down. This was sort of quasi coherent sheaves on um, maps from X into BG Durham. Uh, this is uh, sheaves of well, some two quasi, -co like some higher quasi coherent sheaves on the space of maps from. Um, from uh, the puncture disk into BG Durham. Um, so if those sorts of formulas make sense to you, then you probably know this sort of, sort of thing they appeal to you and um, yeah. Um, and so I'm gonna do something uh, similar over here. So Yang Mills GB of X. So okay, this Sam, is- um... yeah. Is is there is there also some description of that as as modules over the the Satake category? Uh, here, yeah, uh, no. So modules over the Satake category is a full subcategory of this guy. Okay. Um, so basically, if you have an object of this category, um, then uh, then you can take its you know what what you call G of O or L plus G invariance, um, and uh, um, do you, um, does, does the monoidal category you write down appear as endomorphisms of some object? Yeah, actually, let me, let me write like that some down. natural object in, in the was, physics. Thinking, yeah. So, um, so we know that there's supposed to be a vacuum object inside of this category. Um, which is supposed to be this, um, I'm just going to write LG mod a little sloppily. Um, so use of notation. And who is this? So um, this object is going to be the category of D modules on the affine Grassmannian, um, where the scourge is defined to be the quotient homogeneous space LG mod L plus G. It has an action, so D modules have an action. And uh, and this uh, this. Let me just remind LG is equal to maps from the puncture disk into G, and L plus G is going to equal maps from the formal disk into G. And of course, everything's based at this fixed point. So that's what the vacuum object is. It's endomorphisms, which is some kind of um, uh, higher version of the um, Coulomb branch in this context, is, uh, is, is the Sataki category. And, uh, and so if you're given an object here, you can sort of pair it with the vacuum in order to get a category. Um, and, and that um, turns out to be, I mean, there's an adjoint and it's really faithful. So it's, it's some kind of, it's a lossy construction, but it's not lossy on some objects, if that makes sense. Um, but but uh, yeah, w what it sees is like, you know, sort of the stuff you get from the vacuum. Um, I, I, I guess, um, yeah, so that, that makes perfect sense. Um, I, I, I guess I want to ask the opposite question. So if, and, and it, you may just not want to answer it, but if um, like, if I start, start with this 40 theory uh, and, and I want to pull out this description of the two category that you have, um, I, I would try to find a surface operator whose endomorphisms were exactly this D modules on LG. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if that exists. Wait, whose endomorphisms um, are D modules on Gurji? Yeah, no, on, that... on the on D modules on the loop space. The 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 thing you the thing you first wrote down. Oh, uh, there there. Uh, oh, yeah. There is such a thing? It basically comes from like the Dirichlet boundary condition. R wrapped on a surface. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Good. Thank you. Yeah, also, Justin just said that. Uh, awesome. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Um, 
uh, yeah, so this is this is what this um, construction is. And maybe I'll say one one more thing here, which is that um, I'm supposed to have this kind of chiral homology functor, uh, oops, from here into um, into uh, the category of DG categories. That's like the sort of chiral homology once I have this global curve um, in the background. And this is going to be um, sending a category oops, C with this, um, this action of LG will map to uh, say invariance for the space of maps. Um, uh, maybe I'll wait call invariance maps. Uh, in fact, I'm just gonna write this in about right. I'm gonna say it's C tensor over um, D modules on this LG with the category of D modules on bungee with full level structure at this point. Um, so this is uh, G bundles with a trivialization on the formal neighborhood of a point, which you can also think of as sort of D modules on the punctured curve with the trivialization around infinity, like on this circle around infinity. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, let's do the same on the B side real quick. So. Um, on this side, I get quasi co, where you're supposed to wave your hands and say, I, I maybe being sloppy here, um, of uh, the space of local systems for G check. Um, so this is the moduli of um, Durham local systems on X. Um, and Yang Mills G sub B of the puncture disk is going to be, again, um, so I guess I'll write put X here. Um, and this will be sort of what people call two quasi-co or when people call a sheaves of categories over the space of again drawn local systems, but on this puncture disk. Um, and again, there are um, the sort of vacuum object over here is going to be um, the so, sort of say structure category sheaf thing of local systems on the disk. Um, and Carol homologies given by something similar. Um, so, uh, so in this context, um, kind of, you know, what I would call like a little bit like physical. Um, oh, I should say uh, first of all out loud, I'll just say that there's supposed to be again this abstract mirror dual construction for these 40 n equals four theories that swap a and b twists. And so, um, the sort of physical um, uh, formulation of s duality. It's going to say that if you take this 40 n equals 4 theory, um, this is this abstract mirror dual to, um, to 40 n equals 4 or Yang Mills for the Langlands dual group. Um, so uh, the, the Langlands dual group, okay, if your group G is GLN or UN, then the Langlands dual is also GLN or UN. And so Maybe it doesn't seem impressive to you, but it's it's a non-trivial construction in spite of that. <clears throat> um, uh, so physical S duality is, is a conjectural statement that um, two 40 n equals four theories, which are hard even um, really to, to define, uh, are, are uh, equivalent up to this swapping of the supersymmetry algebra. Um, and the sort of uh, algebraic meaning um, is that if you take Yang Mills uh, G sub sub A, that this is going to be equivalent um, to Yang Mills G check sub B, and uh, sort of up to uh, a little bit of blurring about things like quasi co or int co or whatever. Um, uh, this uh, this is basically packaging. Um, uh, geometric Langlands, um, so maybe I should say um, global um, geometric Langlands. So that's the statement that uh, this category is um, equivalent to this category. Um, local um, geometric Langlands, that's the statement that this two category is equivalent to this two category and uh, local global compatibility.
Um, so that local global compatibility would be um, basically considering the equivalence with chiral homology operations. Um, uh, um, okay, so that's uh, that's geometric Langlands from the perspective of of um, these algebraic quantum field theories. So it's just sort of it's a we. This is just a, a, a different language somehow for um, things people have, have known for a long time. Um, so, uh, and no. Uh, okay, so, so now there's uh, a sort of um, uh, natural question, which is like, okay, when you say something like this geometric Lang lens, or I would call this, um, uh, so this is sort of physical S duality. I want to say that this is like, maybe I should call this like algebraic S duality or twisted S duality. Um, <clears throat> is this more sort of meaning for me, meaningful uh, construction or assertion. Um, so I should say like, uh, this is a conjecture and this is a conjecture. Um, uh, Dennis Gates Gorey has done a lot of work on, on the global stuff, and it's not so far from a theorem these days. But um, but if you take this full package, like much um, much weaker footing, it's on much weaker footing. Um, and uh, I should say also that this is a uh, sort of theorem um, as stated um, for um, abelian groups. So I'm just going to write. Um, I'll say S duality twisted um, is a theorem <laughs> as stated for G being GM. So the, um, the issues, the subtle issues here disappear and, um, and this is uh, in some form due to maybe Malone, uh, Valence and Trinfeld. Um, okay, and so um, does the uh, uh, local global compatibility also involve the Hecke eigenvalue property? That's uh, that's a sort of um, how should I say this? Uh, so okay, L let me let me kind of say it, say it this way. So. The Hecke eigenvalue property, just in order to formulate it, you need to know the, the statement of geometric Sataki. And formally, in what I've written here, nothing is the statement of geometric Sataki. Um, so you could start to ask for some kind of compatibility. So for instance, um, uh, with known things, I, I would say. So, um, uh, or how should I say this? Maybe, maybe let me say it a different way. Geometric Sataki is built into the statement by comparing endomorphisms of the vacuum. And if you take that as your like statement of, of geometric Sataki, then the Hecke eigenvalue property is, the Hecke eigenvalue compatibility is sort of tautological from this package. Um, uh, including, including the local global compatibility, as you say. Um, okay, so uh, theorem is stated for, for abelian groups and much more mysterious for GL2. Um, uh, okay, so then there's a sort of natural question when you're playing these kinds of games, like equivalence, like uh, equivalence, uh, tell, tell, me, tell me more, like what, what should match what? Like, is it just supposed to be some equivalence? Is there some ways of pinning it down? And so um, to uh, pin this down, um, the uh, tradition is to use to use uh, uh, compatibility with um, you know what in this language are boundary conditions. Um, so. Uh, so let me um, kind of um, uh, just say uh, some 
So first I'm gonna say some like big one that pins down a lot of stuff and I'm not gonna say more about it because it's not needed in my talks. So a big one is that uh, the, um, the Whitaker um, boundary condition Um, is is supposed to be S dual to uh, what's called critical level, um, like the I don't know how to say this. I don't know what this is like. The critical level Katz Moody brain. So KM here is uh, Katz Moody, I should say. <clears throat> um, and uh, this is one I um, won't discuss, but it's sort of um, in a lot of ways it's the most important one for a lot of the sort of conventional work in geometric Lang lens. Part of what made me interested in this project was uh, was uh, moving beyond things covered by the boundary conditions that um, that I learned a long time ago. Um, so let me give uh, another construction. So this is sort of a construction. Um, so if you're given um, G acting on some uh, variety or stack Y, um, there's going to be a corresponding uh, boundary condition, um, sorry, B sub Y um, for, uh, for uh, this uh, theory being Mills sub, um, sub G, and this is going to be, so to say, compatible with the 3D n equals with the 4D n equals 4 um, supersymmetry. So it, implicitly, just when I write this, it's 4D n equals 4. Um, theory. And so let me just sort of say some kind of remarks about this. So I just, this is the notation, but really, uh, so at least like kind of classically, um, if you ignore quantum things, uh, this, uh, this uh, B sub Y really um, depends on the Hamiltonian um, G space, uh, which is the cotangent bundle of Y with its natural map down to G star. So this is like last time uh, I, I said that um, that uh, that my 3D theory is really a lot of, at least the classical theory depends, the classical 4D, sorry, 3D n equals, oh yeah, I meant to say that Whitaker is um, principal non-pole. Non Thanks. Okay. Um, um, yeah. To, to get Ketz Moody out of that, um, I think you need to consider corner configurations. Yeah, so let, let me multiple boundary. Let me, let me yeah. Let's sort of call this okay. That's fair. So on on this side, uh, let's just how should I say this? Like here, it kind of looks here. Yeah, here you don't see the Ketz Moody algebras appearing if you said it up correct. In these terms. So maybe what I should have said is um, there's okay. I'll I'll, I'll leave it here. Say more. So somehow, when you when you involve further twists, if you if you have this Whitaker condition on one side, you see Katz Moody algebras appearing on the other side. Um, but it's classical level. It's okay to say Neumann. Um, okay. So. Um, Um, so uh, this this uh, boundary condition, yeah, I was saying, really depends only on the Hamiltonian G space. 
Um, and uh, uh, what else do I want to say? Um, oh, and it doesn't really depend the classic the classical theory does. Um, so it, uh, for uh, um, G being trivial, um, this boundary theory um, corresponds to some 3D theory. And I should say it's really a 3D n equals 4 theory um, because of this is it compatibility of supersymmetry algebras. And this 3D n equals 4 theory is going to be um, this T sub y, as I said before. That's because this is a, a boundary condition for the trivial theory. Um, and uh, yeah, and so what I would sort of say is like, I don't, I don't know the, the right words for this like yoga of ideas, but um, I'm gonna say sort of like full 3D um, mirror symmetry. So this is um, so sort of full uh, 3D mirror symmetry is the following kind of assertion. So I'm gonna say a pair consisting of G acting on some X and um, G check acting on some X star our 3D mirror dual. Um, if the following holds, um, so the boundary condition um, for uh, for X. So if I take well, um, if I take its first of all like S dual um, and uh, so I'm going to say that, that these match under S duality. Um, so I'm going to take the boundary condition for this X star, and I'm going to take sort of its 3D mirror dual again. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, I don't think I'm assuming anything about super conformal uh, compatibilities. So th this, what I'm, what I'm saying works uh, works perfectly fine for any, with just these assumptions. <clears throat> so uh, maybe I, I can say like uh, uh, where, where I, I have a guess that that question is coming from. So sometimes the super conformal um, sort of uh, condition, it, it sometimes means that there's an honest vertex algebra around that like that somehow some BRST reduction is makes sense of like a CDO on some kind of um, quotient space. And, uh, and in this formalism, that's, that's uh, in the categorical formalism, that's a little bit disjoint from the consideration. So the categories make sense, even if the vertex algebras don't. Um, so, um, Uh, okay, so let me just kind of briefly uh, give a couple examples. So um, of this, there are many more examples, and I guess I'll comment about this in a second. So one uh, is going to be G is equal to GM acting on this X, which is equal to A1. <clears throat> um, and in this case, the dual group is also GM, and it's going to act on this X star which is also A1. Um, and, uh, and basically this is, so this is what people sometimes call the kind of Tate um, example. Um, and uh, this, is, this is basically going to be the um, theorem of, of uh, Justin and myself. Um, so so uh, kind of for now, the paper, which I swear really will be up there by the end of the day or something, um, it, this is a, we have an equivalence of categories of um, local operators um, sort of with, with the requisite symmetry, which I'll talk about in a second, um, but no, uh, no sort of global aspects. The kind of global parts of it are sort of un, un, unwritten for now. Uh, and just as uh, another sort of fun example, so you can take 
uh, G to be GL2 acting on itself. Um, and it's dual, um, so it's Langland's dual is again GL2. And this is gonna act on a funny space X dual, which is gonna be the moduli space consisting of L, um, a line, um, plus um, a morphism from L into like two dimensional vector space, right? It is K squared, so K is sort of my field. Um, so it's like a line with a map from that line into a two dimensional vector space. Um, and, uh, and that has a, uh, an action of GL2 just because GL2 acts on this vector space. Um, and uh, this is, uh, uh, this is some kind of big example. So in a sense, th this example, if you unwind it, the fact that you have like the regular representation of, of GL2 here, this gives, so for me, this was like the first thing I, I heard that just like kind of blew me away. I heard it from um, from Braverman, although it's in, it traces back to Gaiotto and Witten. And, uh, and it just, it gives a formula basically for um, the kernel for geometric Langlands in a way that just, no one knew before for GL2. There's a generalization for GLN, I should say. Um, let's write down more. Um, so there are many more examples um, of these dual pairs. So, um, so uh, I, maybe I should say like so. It's in um, sort of in work of Gaiotto Witten, um, work of um, Justin and Phil Sang Yu that uh, hasn't uh, appeared yet, but they've given talks about it. Uh, and uh, uh, Benzi uh, Sek Ritis um, Benkatesh. Um, have also been considering this stuff coming from like number theory um, uh, over here and kind of 3D mirror symmetry for David and uh, and they've uh, found uh, uh, as far as I understand examples that weren't known to physicists of these kinds of um, 3D mirror dual pairs based on um, on uh, yeah all, all of the examples oh yeah okay. Just in saying, just in saying, all of their examples are are in Gaiota Witten already, which uh, uh, is true. But also, I don't know. It, it'll, it, it'll be easier to make connections with. I think the way I'm saying it here, when it's written by um, Justin Mitchell saying. Um, and yeah, anyway, they they have uh, many new examples and. Uh, I, uh, I'm surely leaving out a huge expanse of the physics literature where many more of these things are, um, are found. Um, so, uh, so kind of what does uh, 3D mirror symmetry mean here? Um, kind of, uh, so to say, concretely. So, um, so I probably should have said this before. So, like, a boundary condition for this, like x, let's say, um, is going to give me a map. Well, this corresponds um, to some object. So, I guess I'll do sort of the a twisted version of this piece of x. It's going to correspond to the category of d modules on this loop space for x. Which is considered as a category with an action of this loop group for G, um, and and this is on kind of the punctured disk. So it's it's a map from the trivial theory into my Mills theory, and so it, when I evaluate on um, on the punctured disk, I'm getting some object of this two category. Um, and uh, for instance, here um, this object is going to be. Sort of the category, I guess I'll write int co, just don't take anything too, too literally, um, of, of uh, the space of maps from this puncture disk drum into X. Um, uh, 
uh, as an object of uh, this category of this two category of sheaves of categories over local systems for G on the puncture disk. Um, uh, and sorry, this is X mod G. <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, and so sort of uh, like in practice, um, you know, what, what you would say is like the kind of local part of the story in terms of these line operator categories is that um, this uh, like under mirror symmetry, under like mirror symmetry assumptions, this B sub X sub A of, um, of well, I should say this. D modules on um, a space of loops into X um, is going to correspond under local geometric Langlands to this category of um, incoherent sheaves on maps from puncture disk DRAM into this X mod G. Ooh, X, X star mod G check. Um, and so that's the kind of um, uh, concrete meaning, well, concrete in whatever sense. So, uh, so basically any such assertion, I just sort of want to highlight um, is conditional um, on, you know, local geometric Langlands for the pair um, G and G check. Um, there, I should also say there are global um, objects involved as well. So uh, attached to this kind of data, you'll get a certain D module on bun G. So, um, so David, Jonas, and Akshay call that uh, the uh, period sheaf attached to this, uh, this guy X. Um, and, uh, and it was, uh, I guess, originally considered maybe in slightly simplified form by uh, David Gayoto. And uh, and there are and and I should say these guys um, consider them as analogs of of uh, period integrals in number theory, um, and uh, and there are also global objects on the B side. Um, so this is what these guys call L sheaves, and they're sort of again analogs of um, sort of in a sense a family of special values of L functions, um, and uh, and again it was originally considered by um, Davida. And um, <clears throat> uh, and those objects again are supposed to match under global geometric lens. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so maybe that's the kind of uh, yeah. And so so these things should match. So global objects should match. There should be some kind of local global compatibility that's happening as well. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, it's it's all sort of it's short words that encode a big package, I think. Um, and again, the, they're like cool conjectures that you can't uh, generically even kind of. I mean, okay, so um, so they're kind of uh, various. Um, ways uh, to use this um, formalism um, to uh, construct, you know, um, uh, 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 material for your research statement. In other words, to, to construct, you know, conjectures that, that maybe can, can be proved. So, uh, um, uh, so uh, I, I say this, but uh, maybe some of them are taken already. So uh, so kind of one approach would be that you could take um, the group G to be GM, and uh, and so this is what's really covered by um, by our work. So the abelian cases of of mirror symmetry are are um, what we're doing. So another way is that you could um, pair a boundary condition. Um, with uh, with so, if I think about the <clears throat> the 
boundary condition as a map sort of out from Yang Mills to the trivial theory, then whenever I have an object of this local category, so I should say this, I'll, I'll pair um, the following thing. So I guess I should call it B sub X sub A or either A or B. Um, so this will give me a map from, and I'm going to evaluate on the puncture disk. Um, so this is giving me a map from Yang Mills G sub A or B of the puncture disk um, into EG categories. So I can pair, pair is not the right word, sort of evaluate um, this functional on the vacuum object, aka like in the A or B twist, which is uh, the sheaves on the FN Grossmannian here. And so uh, uh, many such examples. So in that case, you're sort of in the regime where things are known and sort of you're putting yourself basically in the setting of geometric Sataki kind of along with um, along the lines of Tudor's comments from earlier. Um, sorry, I should. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll look at the discussion in a second when I finish this. So, um, so many such examples. I think there are three papers now um, are um, work of uh, and then I should get the names in the right order. So Braverman, Ginkelberg. Uh, so Ginsberg is involved on some papers and not all, and uh, Roman Trafkin. Um, so, and of course, maybe you'll have more clever ideas about what to do. Okay, so I wanted to take a look at the comments. So, um, so, uh, so uh, there, there are a few. So, so Eswin had asked um, about the role of the group G. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so maybe I, I can address that, that kind of very quickly. So, so for in, in this discussion, there's formally not a 3D theory around. So I'm talking about a single boundary condition for this one 4D theory, which in the, in the case of a trivial group is the same as a 3D theory, but otherwise it's a boundary condition for a 4D theory different from a 3D theory. Now, there are ways to concoct 3D theories out of that kind of data. Namely, if you have a second boundary condition for Yang Mills, you can pair your two boundary conditions together in order to get a 3D theory. That'll be, that'll, you sort of compose, you get, you know, interface. You're putting like Yang Mills in the middle and Triv over here and Triv over here, I think if you're a physicist. So, um, so, uh, uh, so that will be a 3D theory. Now there are two favorite ways to do that. There are two favorite boundary conditions for this um, Yang Mills theory. One is Dirichlet, that's the case when G acts on itself. And the other is uh, Neumann, which is the case when G acts on just a point. Um, and, uh, and if you, you uh, pair, your boundary condition for the 4D theory with Dirichlet, you say that the resulting theory has uh, has uh, flavor symmetry G. So that's uh, so. In other words, flavor symmetry for a 3D theory is kind of a lift to like a boundary condition for Yang Mills, so that when you compose with Dirichlet, you're getting back your original theory. So that's the, that would be my sort of definition of flavor symmetry. And I would say the same thing for gauge symmetry, except with Neumann instead of Dirichlet. It's again just another way of saying a boundary condition for Yang Mills, but um, but the resulting 3D theory that you were thinking about really came by pairing with Neumann instead of pairing with um, Dirichlet. Um, so it's two different ways of lifting. Um, okay, I think that's uh, it. Seems more or less like what what Justin was writing here, but I just put it out loud. Um, uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, so now I've got uh, five more minutes. I'll just say um, so what we actually show um, with the fairy tale is kind of over. Um, so uh, so I'm going to write just D instead of um, D modules, and uh, and I'm going to write it a little bit uh, formally. So uh, in fact, D module. So now, now the fictions sort of uh, should stop a little bit. So one uh, one funny thing is that 
in, uh, in the world of kind of these infinite dimensional algebraic varieties, there are two flavors of D modules actually. Um, there's one that's called D shriek and there's one that's called D star. And it, you should think of it as, as similar to the following. So um, usual varieties are sort of like finite sets in a way. And, uh, and for finite sets, D, well, and D modules on varieties are sort of like functions on finite sets. And on finite sets, there's sort of a favorite measure on the space of functions, just like, I don't, you know, every delta has size one or something like that. Um, and so like functions are the same as measures in that case. But when you're in the infinite dimensional situation, it's more like being on some kind of infinite or profinite or something like that. And, uh, and functions become different from measures. And so this guy is the one that's analogous to functions. And if I wrote D star, it would be the one that's analogous to measures. Um, and so uh, uh, the statement is that um, this is uh, equivalent to intco star on um, the space of maps from the puncture disk DRAM into A1 mod GM. Um, so, uh, and, uh, and then there's some kind of uh, compatibilities here. So there's this action of D modules on the loop space for GM on the left-hand side. Um, and uh, and there's an equivalence due to Balenson and Drinfeld that sort of amounts to this local geometric Lang lens in this setting. That this is the same as um, quasi coherent sheaves on the space of local systems for GM on the puncture disk. Um, this naturally acts on the right hand side, and uh, and our equivalence is compatible with this action. So this amounts to sort of um, you know, again, mod, mod global aspects, this amounts to saying that we um, match these two boundary conditions for, um, so, I mean, first of all, you could kind of forget these, these actions and you get an instance of vanilla mirror symmetry. So um, I, I should say some of this, like in this setting, you don't get an equivalence of categories here in general for G, but it happens for GM basically because Dirichlet and Neumann are, are dual in that case. Um, uh, uh, so, um, yeah, so this in, in co-star, it's some, uh, some kind of complicated thing. So kind of at a technical level, um, this sort of space of maps, um, from puncture disk DRAM into this A1 my GM, um, is built from sort of singular um, sort of like infinitely singular um, non-Noetherian rings um, uh, and so um, basically like as far as I know this this theorem is like the first time a space kind of that bad has like had anything good happening with it in geometric representation theory it's like it's like a really bad uh, you know like in in the hierarchy of spaces, it's just like horrible, um, and uh, and yet we we sort of can still make sense of its coherent sheaves, and uh, and we find sort of some lovely D modules on some infinite dimensional affine space uh, sitting there, um, and yeah. So I'm hoping uh, next time to be able to say a little bit about how our construction goes because it just um, for me it's it's some sort of happy construction and. Uh, in uh, uh, some kind of representation theory, sort of geometric representation theory stuff, and um, and there's a lot of details to check, but the the sort of main construction isn't necessarily so impossible. So um, yeah, that's what I've got. All right, thanks a lot, Tim. Um, Um, are there any questions? Or anything left over from, from the chat? Yeah, Aswin? Uh, yeah, so uh, I think th this is a bit of a leftover from the chat, so uh, can anyone, either Sam or somebody in the audience, explain why uh, even the 
non-conformal cases are interesting in this sort of setting. Uh, uh, I think multiple people have given answers, including Sam and Tudor, but I, I probably didn't fully understand. Like when the boundary theory, uh, okay, oh, actually let me phrase my question this way. So what does it mean to say that a non-conformal 3D n equal to four theory has a mirror uh, to a, uh, uh, I'm sort of, I mean, in 3D n equal to two, there are things like cyborg duality and so on. So those things work in a slightly more general setting, but I somehow naively thought the usual statement of 3D mirror symmetry is sort of in the more restricted conformal setting. Am I uh, mistaken? I mean, like things like the, the Higgs branch and the Coulomb branch, they, they make perfectly good sense without super conformal assumptions. Uh, true, but the statement that they get exchanged uh, when you go to the mirror dual and so on, I thought that was sort of restricted to the conformal case, no? Uh, no, I mean, the supersymmetry algebra has this outer, outer automorphism. Right. So it... I don't know, there, there's, there's, a, there's a thing I might say about that if, if that's okay. So, um, the, so the topological twist of a 3D n equals four theory makes sense without passing to the infrared. Um, and and so, so, so you, you can write down a Lagrangian or think about a theory at finite energy, take its topological twist. And, and then that has a whole set of algebraic structures associated to it. Um, um, thing, and things like a category of line operators and an algebra of local operators and so on. Um, and, and then you can just ask, like, are there two 3D n equals four theories such that these algebraic structures in the A twist of one match the structures in the B twist of the other? Um, and that, that is a question that does not require flowing to the infrared and um, like makes sense for the sorts of examples that Sam looked at where you've got a sigma model into the group or a T star of the group. Um, and, and similarly, you can use such theories to define boundary conditions for the A and B twists of 40 Yang mills without flowing to the infrared. I see, okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, Chris. Chris had a question. I think if if you if you're still there, you put your hand down. Um, if you don't mind, can I can I ask about these algebraic um, quantum field theories again? I'm I'm just curious um, whether so so for for example these sort of A and B twisted theories is, is there like a hierarchy of choices of of these sort of algebraic theories that you can construct depending on like the rule conditions? Like in the D module on the A side, is there a tempered version and a denormalized version associated to the different sort of choices of support conditions that you have for the global categories? Can you do this? Um, I'm asking if you can sort of do this coherently. I guess. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, morally, the answer should be yes. Um, but these kinds of um, uh, but I think that the local story isn't understood well enough. So like already in the global setting, there's, there's uh, maybe uh, four possible or, or infinitely many possible things that you could say for what the tempered category is, um, depending how, how generous you are in counting things. And they're not known to be equivalent. And so that, that, kind, of, um, that kind of thing causes a little bit of, of um, uh, of, of an issue just already in the global so, context. Dario has um, some results, right? That maybe he's going to talk about in his talk um, in a couple of days. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so Dario um, knows that maybe three and four on the list are equivalent. Yeah, sure. um, but I, I think that, that um, I mean, the, the, there's three definitions one involving sort of Whitaker things, one involving Katz Moody things, and one involving. Um, uh, the action of the Sataki category. And the action of the, the Sataki category maybe is at one point or maybe it's at infinitely many points. And Dario can show that the last two things are the same, as, as I understand. Um, so, uh, but, so in the local context, 
that Sataki one isn't um, isn't available in the first place, um, and the at least no one no one no at, at least some analog of it is isn't known, and uh, and beyond that uh, the equivalence of the other ones isn't known. So like to some extent you know like there's sort of what should really happen is like that this Yang Mills G sub B should be smaller than this Yang Mills well, or G check sub B should be smaller than the Yang Mills G sub A. And so they're, they're, and that should be like a literally true statement. And then there should be something that corresponds to it. Um, and, uh, and do we have an ability in modern day to construct it? Not, not that I'm aware of, um, but, but of course, you know, boy can dream really. Was, was that all? Yeah, yeah, that was my question. That was, that was really helpful. Thank you. Any, any other questions or comments? OK, well, let's all thank Sam again. Um, yeah, I think that's the last talk of this session. <laughs> <laughs>